this time on Psychic Investigators. A young woman vanishes without a word. In the back of my mind, she was hitchhiking and somebody had gotten a hold of her. The police think she's run away, but a psychic sees murder. I feel it was a crime of passion. The case goes cold for almost 30 years. We thought that, you know, something more could be done on the case. Let's take another look at it and see where it goes. But can a psychic's visions crack a cold case from so long ago? You really can't expect somebody that's been lying for 25 years to all of a sudden say, I did it. Los Altos, California, in the foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Once known for its orchards, by the late 1970s, it's become a bedroom community for Bay Area commuters. It was a very quiet, calming place. It was a affluent as it is today. The people who lived here cared greatly about their community. Los Altos is a safe haven a good place to raise a family, or so it seemed. On March 28, 1978, 17-year-old Laura Ann Byerly, a student at Los Altos High, vanishes without a trace. When she doesn't come home that night, her parents file a missing persons report. Police quickly decide Laura has run away, with good reason. She had run away at least six times, and uh, she had had problems with her parents. She would run away, she would disappear. Uh, she had been gone for several weeks, and then she would reappear, come back home. She'd always keep in contact with her friends, and then, you know, come back into the household to make amends with her mom. Mary Cressy has been Laura's best friend since the eighth grade. Every time that she ran away, I was always the first person she'd go to. She ran away, but she always came right back. Her parents, Irwin and Betty Byerly, are sure that this time she hasn't run away. Recently, she's been turning her life around. She was rebuilding her relationship with her parents. She had uh, decent friends and wanted to change. But the police are certain that Laura has taken off, and her friends are hiding it. So you guys saw her yesterday, and if you guys have seen her, you know her. They questioned us about last time we had seen Laura. And they said, well, has she contacted you? And I said, no. I was like a sister to Laura. We, we stuck together through everything. We would take her parents' station wagon out, and we'd unhook the speedometer so they wouldn't know we were going somewhere. <laughs> we would say we'd be in town going shopping, but actually we'd head to Santa Cruz. She was just a social butterfly. <laughs> she trusted people. At the Byerly's insistence, police proceed with a routine missing persons investigation. They discover that the day she disappeared, Laura broke up with one young man, Scott Schultz, and made a date with another, John McFoland. The day she had disappeared, she had gone to school that morning. She had the same class as this John McFoland in the morning. Two witnesses say they saw her leaving going into the parking lot area. She did not go to her second period class. She was never seen again. The police question Laura's ex, Scott Schultz. He tells the police that he was home and uh, he never saw Lori. He thought she was going to hitchhike over to the house. The police have no reason to doubt Scott Schultz. Laura is known to hitchhike. With no witnesses and no evidence of foul play, the investigation winds down. But there's still no sign of Laura, and her mother won't give up. 
she didn't know why she would run away. She didn't know why she, she just disappeared. She had no idea what happened. Betty felt in her heart something had gone wrong. I was the one that suggested to hire a psychic, and that's where Annette Martin came in. Annette Martin is a well-respected California psychic who's helped to solve crimes for law enforcement agencies across the country, including the FBI. 10 days after her daughter's disappearance, Betty Byerly visits the psychic and provides her with a photograph of Laura. I close my eyes and I take a couple of deep breaths and immediately I begin to receive impressions from that photograph. Laura did not run away at all. The police are wrong. <laughs> Then, the psychic says something no mother wants to hear. The most difficult thing in the world is to tell a mother that her child is dead. <laughs> Seventeen-year-old Laura Byerly has gone missing from her Los Altos home. Desperate to find her daughter, Betty Byerly has met with a psychic what she tells her is devastating. I mean, my daughter's dead. It feels that way. Oh, my God. It feels that way. Oh, my God. I, I, I'm not getting any, any impulses of, um, of uh, life here. Then the psychic offers another striking revelation. She names the killer. I saw a name, and the name was Scott. She goes, that's her boyfriend. Then I saw that he had taken her to this place that was in the woods and saw him driving down towards Santa Cruz. They were arguing and fighting. I saw him shaking her. I feel it was a crime of passion. And then I saw him bury her in a very shallow grave. Betty was in a state of shock. I had said that the police would not find her body, but I saw a hiker finding her body. And I said to uh, Betty, have they, have they spoken to this Scott? And she said, yes, they have. Betty clings to the hope the psychic is wrong. But in her heart, she believes Laura is dead, murdered by her boyfriend, and buried in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I remember sitting in her mom's living room and crowing our eyes out together, going, no, it can't happen. It can't happen to her only daughter. Laura's mother turns the tape over to the police and begs them to look more closely at Scott Schultz. She tells them that Laura and Scott have been dating for six months, that he's bad news, controlling and possessive, a dropout who's going nowhere. With Scott, she seemed to be a different person. She would sit there and would clam up. I felt in my heart that she was almost afraid of him. But Laura was moving away from her boyfriend. The morning she disappeared, she broke up with him in a long phone call Laura's mother Hello. describes to police. The phone call started about 1.40 in the morning and they talk for four hours. According to Laura, they talk about their relationship, how she's, you know, no longer wants a relationship with him, he's very emotional, he cries on the phone several times related to them breaking up, and that she's going in a different direction. In the morning, she notices that Laura's crying, and Laura tells her, hey, I just broke up with Scott, I broke up with him on the phone, I feel bad that I didn't do it in person. And the mom just tells her, you know, hey, don't worry about it, just go to school, you know, things will get better. 
It's the last time Betty Byerly sees her daughter alive. Despite the psychic suspicions, the police still have nothing to link Scott to Laura's disappearance. The police have nothing on him and no reason to believe Laura has been murdered. However, they search a small section of the mountains where the psychic says Laura will be found. But they find nothing. Police set the case aside. Weeks and months go by with no news. Then, more than a year after Laura vanished, hikers in the Big Basin State Park make a grisly find. Well, April 1979, some hikers uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains going along a trail, their dog goes off to the side, uh, and he brings out what appears to be a bone. The people kind of look at it, and then they, they discover that, hey, this is a human mandible. They also find some clothing and some other items, and they gather all these items. So they go alert the ranger, the ranger who then calls the police department. They recognize it as a crime scene. The Santa Cruz County Coroner concludes the young woman has been dead for at least a year. Her name is Laura Byerly. The police contact Mary Cressy, now living in Salem, Oregon. They said that they'd like to fly in and interview me, and they would like to have me look at some items that belonged to Laura. I had to do this because her dad had died six months after Laura disappeared, and I don't think that her mom was able to handle the pressure. I had to identify her shoes, I had to identify her black polyester pants, and I had to identify her sheer flower top. That's all that was left. Her jewelry wasn't there, and Laura always wore jewelry. So I thought that was quite odd. The Santa Cruz police join with Los Altos to investigate what is now considered a homicide. They re-interview witnesses, including Scott Schultz, but uncover no new leads. The Los Altos detective re-interviews Scott at that time. In fact, at this time, it's the most thorough interview of Scott done by the Los Altos Police Department. Uh, but he's really never really taken on as a major suspect in this case. Uh, they can't tie him to the crime scene. They, they can't tie him to her disappearance. He's just kind of a player that really has never been identified. As far as they're concerned, she was a runaway. Again, the case goes cold. In 1996, Betty Byerly dies in a house fire. With both her parents dead, it seems Laura's memory is dying too. But in 2005, nearly 30 years after she vanished, cold case investigator detective Michael Shembry gets a call from Laura's old friend, Mary Cressy. It was always in the back of my mind that there had to be an answer to this. When I said, you need to pursue it, you need to keep after them, and you need to make sure that this does not get closed again. She felt at the time, in 1978, that the police department really hadn't done a thorough investigation. And she thought that if we reopened the case and started contacting people, maybe something could be done. And especially in this case, because there was really no family members alive, and there was really nobody else that was, you know, kind of holding the torch to get this thing done. We read it, and we thought that, you know, something more could be done on the case. Let's take another look at it and see where it goes. One detail in Laura's file that catches the detective's eye is a reference to psychic Annette Martin. But the tape of the psychic's reading is missing. Mike Chambry called me on the phone and said to me, I was just wondering if you would possibly have a copy of that tape. And I said, yes. I keep a copy of every single murder case. A lot of these old cases, you'll find that the family has made contact with a psychic. It's not uncommon. 
If somebody has this ability, that's great. And in this case, it's been open for 25 years. It's certainly not going to hurt. And that had specific information about the location of the body and what took place. And, and that information given at that time was not that far off base. The psychic had predicted Laura's murder and how her body would be found. But will her visions help the police track the killer? It's been nearly 30 years since the remains of 17-year-old Laura Byerly were found in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Her killer has never been found. Cold case investigator Michael Shembry listens to the long-lost tape of a psychic reading. Scott, it definitely has something to do with her disappearance. It's very sick. In it, the psychic zeroes in on the boyfriend, Scott Schultz, who police eliminated as a suspect all those years ago. So I wanted to talk to her to see if there was any other information or any other feelings that maybe I could take a look at or would point me in a direction where I would get other evidence that would really help in this case. When you're listening to a psychic statement and you're reading the psychic statement, you're still a police officer. So you know that you're just taking this information and you're gonna take it and see if you can do anything with it. Will it provide me a witness? Will it give me a better look at the crime scene? Will it show me a different location where they could have been earlier? Or give me something that I didn't have before? So that's how I looked at her information. Because you realize this information is not admissible in court. You can't walk into court and say, the psychic said that Scott Schultz killed her, so therefore we rest our case. The deeper Shembry digs, the more his suspicions match the psychics. There were several facts that just didn't make any sense. The fact that she had talked to him that morning for four hours. She had gone to school, and she had made a date in her first period class with her new boyfriend, John McFollin. Then she had a hair appointment later on at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. To me, a young lady that had just made a date with her new boyfriend that had a hair appointment, she wouldn't run away. She wouldn't disappear unless something specifically happened to her. Shembry tracks down Scott Schultz, now 46, and a mechanic in Loveland, Colorado. Before interviewing Scott, the detective talks to Cheryl Schultz, his ex-wife. The story she tells him only serves to heighten his suspicions. She talks about an incident in 1990 where she is going through his items. She finds this box in the back of one of his dressers. And inside the box, she finds this article about this girl that has uh, disappeared in the bones being found in the Santa Cruz Mountains. She also finds a ring, and she finds a couple other items. And she kind of wonders, who, you know, who is this? He's never talked to me about this, but obviously it's pretty important because he's kept the article. Eventually, she asks him about this, and he just kind of blows it off, just saying it was an ex-girlfriend. So you have that information. It's like, you know, why would he keep these items? Re-interviewing everyone who gave statements originally finally pays off. A woman who was a friend of Scott's reveals to Shembry that 30 years ago, Scott's uncle owned a weekend home eight miles from where Laura's body was found. Scott knew the area well. When I saw that he had an uncle that lived on China Gray, then I knew I could tie him to the crime scene. And once I knew I could tie him to the crime scene, then I knew this case was over with. All I had to do was build it up. All I had to do was get the circumstantial evidence that would put it all together and that would give you enough probable cause to arrest this guy. The four-hour phone call the box of mementos. Now, the connection to the crime scene. The detective has enough for a warrant. August 23, 2006. Shembry searches Scott's Colorado home. He discovers Laura's rings, her photograph, and a news clipping. Crucial evidence. Shembry gives psychic Annette Martin a call. Michael Shambri told me that he was going the next day to Colorado to arrest Scott. And I said, oh, wonderful. Finally, finally, we're going to have closure on this case. Scott Schultz is arrested for the first degree murder of his high school girlfriend almost three decades earlier. They called me up and said that they had just arrested Scott Schultz for the murder of Laura Byerly. I'll never forget it. 
And I just burst out in tears and said, finally. Brian Welsh is the DA who prosecuted the case. This really was a classic case of all the circumstantial evidence when looked at in its entirety pointed to Scott Schultz and his guilt. But he had steadfastly denied killing Laura when he had been interviewed on a number of occasions by the investigators. Scott Schultz is extradited to California where he pleads no contest to a reduced charge of voluntary manslaughter. Voluntary manslaughter in, in this case is referred to as a heat of passion crime. Under California law, a person can plead either guilty or no contest. In this case, he pled no contest. At the time he entered the plea, the court informed him that a no contest plea would be treated as a guilty plea. By pleading no contest, Scott Schultz avoids the uncertain outcome of a jury trial, and the full details of how Laura died are never revealed. But the cold case investigator's best guess is that she and Scott argued, emotions ran high, and Scott killed her in a fit of rage, just as the psychic visualized all those years ago. Some people have the ability to see things. I mean, as you get older, there's a lot of things that you were really firmly disbelieve when you were younger that as you get older, you say, you know what? Maybe uh, that's possible. Because he was a minor at the time, Scott Schultz is sentenced to just two years in prison. I was saddened. Here, my best friend's gone, and all he got was two years? Where's justice? I feel in my heart that justice will be done and he will eventually have to pay the price fully. One thing is certain, without the psychic insights of Annette Martin and the dogged determination of a cold case detective, the murder of Laura Ann Byerly may have remained unsolved forever. This time on Psychic Investigators, a swimming instructor is found stabbed to death in a quiet Florida town. Someone couldn't have walked out of there that wasn't covered with blood. But the case is going nowhere, fast. There was no physical evidence to arrest him. Until a psychic claims to see the killer. It's just a disgusting crime of extreme terror. But are his visions enough to crack the case? He says, the killer's nearby, the killer's nearby. Boynton Beach, Florida, an hour north of Miami, a quiet coastal town where people escape the troubles of everyday life. Violent crime generally happens someplace else. It's August, and Mae Wentz, a part-time swimming instructor, has run into trouble with her neighbors. Mae, unmarried and living alone, has a habit of leaving her door open for her beloved German Shepherd, Duke. She would let her dog run loose and became a problem with the town. Get out of there. The neighbors complaining about dumping garbage cans and so forth. By August 5th, her neighbors are so fed up, they report the dog. Duke is caught and taken to the pound. Days go by and neighbors expect to see May looking for her dog, but there's no sign of her. Duke has been left stranded. Finally, on Sunday, August 7th, a worried neighbor checks in and smells a strange odor coming from the bedroom and immediately calls the police. May Wentz was lying on the floor next to the bed. She had been stabbed. Sergeant John DiBattista was the first on the scene. There was a lot of blood all over the bedroom, on the walls, on the bed, on the floor. 
Lieutenant Ed Hillary is the lead investigator in the case. There were two pieces of a knife at the crime scene. One was the point of the knife, and then one was the broken part of the blade. We never found the handle. Aside from this, the killer has left little evidence. We were able to lift several latent fingerprints, but they were subsequently identified as belonging to May Wentz. From the state of decomposition, police determine how long May Wentz has been dead. We had a possible time span of when the crime occurred, and that was two to three days. But this only makes things harder for the police. It's the first 48 hours that are the most crucial in any murder investigation, and those hours are gone. Adding to the mystery, nothing in the house seems misplaced, ruling out robbery as a motive. And the autopsy later confirms that there was no sexual assault. Her only enemies, it seems, are feuding neighbors. We had no reports of cars leaving the area quickly or anything like that, so we had the feeling with the blood all over the walls, someone couldn't have walked out of there that wasn't covered with blood. If they went any distance, possibly someone would see him. We figured it was somebody nearby. With little evidence, the detectives have their work cut out for them. The police contact May's family in New Jersey with the news. I was shocked. There were all kinds of questions running through your mind that, you know, what could have happened? Who could have done this? The very concept that uh, there might be someone out there randomly attacking women is always alarming to the community. Laura Belgrave covered the story for the local paper. I think the community felt fear and uh, something of an anxiety for it to be solved. It was a woman brutally murdered in the kind of fashion that in particular scares all women. And because no one knew who the killer was, you have to worry, is there some crazy out there? You know, is this someone who could break into my house? She was just an everyday person. Over the next few days, the police learn more about the 41-year-old swimming instructor. May was a kind and gentle and quiet person. She had a lot to give to people. She was very active with her swimming lessons. I would go up maybe every few weeks, and we'd go out water skiing or just go down to the beach. It was good times. As the police dig deeper, the mystery widens. You ask 10 different people about May Wentz, and they'll give you 10 different answers. She didn't get along very well with neighbors. Not to the extent that, uh, you know, there was altercations or anything like that, but a lot of verbal stuff back and forth. They'd get a lead, and they'd say, this is it. We're going to, you know, and it would peter out. It was difficult. It could have been anybody. But two neighbors do stand out from the crowd. Brothers Darris and Jerry Mills both have a long history with local law enforcement. They live directly across the street from May Wentz. They had been involved with Boynton Beach Police Department on several different occasions, uh, drunk and disorderly fighting and, and things like that. With no other leads, police decide to check them out. Detective DiBattista conducts a voice stress analysis, a test similar to a lie detector. It measures psychophysiological stress responses in the human voice. The voice stress analysis that I performed on Jerry, I asked him several questions, and he showed deception. He showed stress on several of the controlled questions. And it was my opinion that he had knowledge of the homicide. As far as Darius Mills goes, he didn't show deception. Based on the interviews, Detective DiBattista suspects Jerry Mills knows more than he's saying, but his hands are tied. There was no physical evidence in which to arrest him. All you got was sort of a, a floating, well, that week I might have, you know, I might have done this or I might have done that. Uh, I was drunk, I, went, I got in a fight. That's, that's the kind of stuff you'd get from them, but you'd, nothing you could pin them down with as to where they were. Weeks go by, and the May Wentz case is slowly going cold. By a strange twist of fate, the National Enquirer is holding a psychic demonstration in Boynton Beach. The chief of police has been invited, but he tells Detective Ed Hillary to go in his place. 
I said, you got to be kidding. I said, do you want me to go see a, a, a spoon twister? <laughs> right? He says, yeah, I want you to go up there for me because I, I promised him I'd be there. Before Ed left, I said, Ed, why don't you talk to the psychic? Maybe we can get him to take a look at the May Wentz case. Ed wasn't very happy when I asked him about that, using black magic to solve homicides. But we had no physical evidence to go on. You know, it had worked in the past. Let's try it. At the demonstration, Detective Hillary meets with well-known psychic Phil Jordan and learns he's also deputy sheriff in his hometown of Ithaca, New York. My psychic insights with police investigation are to perceive impressions about a crime that ordinary investigation has not been able to come up with. The fact that he had been used to find people that were lost, uh, find bodies, that impressed me. The detective invites Phil Jordan to the station to look into the case. But will his psychic insights help to solve the brutal murder of Mae Wentz? She's trying to fight his blood spattering all over. 41-year-old Mae Wentz is found stabbed to death in her Boynton Beach, Florida home. Four weeks have passed. The killer is still at large. With no hard evidence, and dwindling leads, detectives turned to psychic Phil Jordan for help. And I had all the files here to give me. He said, no, 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 no. I don't want to touch that. I don't want to know anything about the file. Just give me a picture. As I looked at the picture of May Wentz, I began to perceive a lot of different things. I felt her to be a very independent woman. I felt she was a good person, but very much an individual, very much to herself. I see that she's a twin. I see a pink house. I began to sense things about the murder itself. And I see them violently stabbing Mae Wentz. Phil Jordan is dead right about the way Mae Wentz died. From not knowing anything about it, he told us that she was stabbed. It was pretty amazing. Even more astounding, Mae did have a twin, her sister Loretta. The fact that he knew that there was a twin uh, before we did certainly impressed me. The police are also intrigued at the mention of a pink house. They took me to the scene of the crime. They told me that this was the house the crime occurred in, and I was taken back a bit because I perceived the house to be pink in color. As it turns out, the house was pink. We noticed right away that the house was a different color because the owner of the house had repainted it. Uh, after it was cleaned up, and I guess he was getting ready to try and rent it or sell it. I immediately felt I had to go in the house because I believe that's where the crime did occur. I had an eerie feeling about the bedroom. I stood in the doorway, and I began to sense things. I see a person. I see him coming into the house. I see that he's wearing a brown uniform. I see May Wentz. And I see the crime beginning to be created. She's trying to fight. She was aware of who was doing it. And I see him stabbing her with a knife. Her body's being punctured with that knife. There's blood spattering all over. You actually feel the knife penetrating your own being where it penetrated her being. And then as the chaos continued, I realized that the tip of the knife was broken off. It hit a part of her body or a bone that that broke the tip of the knife right off.
Then I feel the need to get out of there. Something's drawing me to the outside. The person that committed this crime was close. Phil walked across the street, and he stopped. It's almost like a suffocating feeling of fear or paranoia overcomes you. He says, my god, the, the, the killer's nearby. The killer's nearby. And he's looking right at the Mills brothers' house. <laughs> that really uh, got me. Now I'm becoming a believer because we never told him that the, the Mills residence was where we had suspects. It was kind of creepy. The psychic's revelations seem to confirm what the police already suspect that one of the Mills brothers killed Mae Wentz. But where is the rest of the broken knife? I immediately asked myself, where would the handle of the knife be? The thing that kept coming to me was under a boat, under a boat. Where is the boat? The boat is where the perpetrator of the crime lives. John and I both looked in the <laughs> backyard looking for this boat. What they find, nothing. Phil Jordan returns to New York, leaving the police to figure out the meaning of the brown uniform and the boat. Driving back in the car, John and I were looking at each other and say, this guy's on point with things. Let's tell the guys that we possibly should be looking for someone in a brown uniform, maybe a delivery guy. Find out if we can develop any suspects in the area. Intrigued by the psychic's vision of a boat, the detective has an idea. John says, you know what we got to do? We have to look at those aerial photographs. As far as aerial photographs, that's a standard operating procedure any homicide for the crime scene investigator to go up uh, and take aerial photographs of the neighborhood. We went back to headquarters. The first thing we did is we checked the photographs, and we found a boat. <laughs> Phil Jordan was right. There was a boat at the Mills residence. Could this be where the murder weapon was thrown on the night of the crime? On the day the photographs were taken, that was just shortly after the event. When Phil came, there was no boat behind the house. It had been moved. Although the police now have evidence that there was a boat, they can't get a search warrant on the word of a psychic. We had no reason to go on the Mills property because, you know, he needed probable cause, and we had no probable cause. But now, there's another twist. Investigation brought to light that uh, Darris Mills worked for a landscaping company that wore brown uniforms. Is this the brown uniform that Phil Jordan claimed to see? Prompted by the psychic's remarkable visions, May Wentz's neighbor, Darris Mills, is now the prime suspect. But without any concrete evidence, how can the police prove he is the killer. A small Florida town is gripped in fear when a swimming instructor is brutally murdered in her home. With the help of psychic Phil Jordan, police now have a prime suspect in their sights, but they can do nothing. In any murder investigation, you're gonna have to be able to tie the victim and the perpetrator together. You gotta have some physical evidence or, or eyewitness or something. It's very frustrating that you can't make an arrest. When you know deep down that somebody committed the crime. Sergeant DiBattista and I were particularly bummed out by this because we had a perfect record. It was a thing of pride also for us. And we were working real hard on it. That's, that's, that's the part that hurt, was we wanted to continue that record. We wanted to get this bad guy off the streets, and we just couldn't get it done. The detectives believe Darris Mills is the killer, but with no proof, the case slowly goes cold. The investigation continued for um, several months till everything just sort of ran out. It was looked at less and less and less. Over three years, it had petered out to the point where it was a cold case until it just went away. But it didn't go away in our minds, I'll tell you that. The community really wanted an end and a resolution to the May Wentz case. There was a loss that shouldn't have been. 
And when you go and you see a, a neighborhood where this has taken place, for example, it's changed somehow. It's almost in the air. May's family continues to pressure the police for answers. As a family member, you don't want the police to stop. You want them to spend every minute of the day on solving that crime. If this happened again, who would be to blame? Over the years, psychic Phil Jordan stays in touch with detectives from his home in Ithaca, New York. Though the investigation is cold, the psychic impressions are the same whether they would be three years or 23 years. You become so involved in the case that you actually feel a part of the case. And I was sure that Darris Mills was the person involved with the crime. But the case gathers dust on the shelf for three and a half years until the police unexpectedly catch a break. On March 9, 1981, Darris Mills is brought in on burglary charges. Police call Phil Jordan to let him know. When I have a case where we have somebody in custody, I would either do prayers that they would turn themselves in or confess to the crime. That doesn't always have to be verbally done. That can be done just through concentrated effort and thought. Darris was incarcerated in the county jail. In the middle of the night, he woke up screaming and hollering. The jailer went to him. He says, I killed a woman in Boynton Beach. He says, I killed her. I killed May Wentz. Darris Mills tells police that voices in his head urged him to confess to May Wentz's murder. On the night of August 3rd, 1977, Darris Mills says he went to May's house looking for sex. He claimed they had a one-night stand a few years earlier. Since she always left her door open for the dog, Darris had easy access to the house. He had a knife. He woke her up. They started to fight. Darris choked her and stabbed her until the knife broke. He then fled the house with the handle and threw it in his backyard. Some of the stuff he said is just tremendous. No question about it, it was on point. The fact that the knife had been thrown by a boat and the fact that he knew the gentleman had a brown uniform, he lived in the neighborhood close by. I mean, these weren't things that he was just kind of guessing at. Darris Mills is convicted on second degree murder charges. He is later diagnosed with schizophrenia. But could the voices that prompted Darris Mills to confess be something else. For me, the power of prayer is one of the strongest energies and strongest powers in the world. And I like to believe that that does have strong significance. And I believe in this case it did. You almost have to believe in, in psychic power. Uh, you know, it really can't be denied. You know, I'm not going to rule anything out. Apparently, it worked. Some people believe that psychics are fakes or phonies, but I believe that some people do have a gift or a power to be able to foresee things or uh, visualize things. Whatever prompted Darris to confess, the killer is now behind bars. Nothing is worse for an investigator than to leave an open case. I was very relieved. That made us feel good. Bad guy zero. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we felt. Having interfaced with a psychic, I was impressed. As a chief, would I talk to my investigator uh, who's hit the wall? Yeah, I'd tell him to try a psychic. It works. If they can help you solve a case, I think it's well worth trying. May Wentz's family can finally begin to find closure. It puts a spot in your heart. You've lost something that's not going to come back, but maybe the process of this being over with can begin. Grief stops our life. In a tragic death such as May Wentz, 
it's hard to continue from beyond that point, especially if there's unanswered questions. This time on Psychic Investigators, a young mother vanishes. Send me a sign. Where are you? And the police can't find her. No leads came. Nothing. Until a psychic tunes into her spirit. Little blips of things that were coming through. And claims to see what no one else can. Could feel her getting dizzy, heart fluttering. But are his visions too late? I didn't feel she was alive. Is the damage already done? Wasn't adding up. People involved, they got away with something. of New York City sits Sayreville, New Jersey. Once an industrial powerhouse, by 1996, a bedroom community. Not only do commuters cross the bridge from the big city, but drugs and the damage they do also make their way to Sayreville. On June 1st, 22-year-old single mom, Nicole Arocas, heads out for a night on the town with friends. The former NYU student lives at home with her parents leaving her 16-month-old daughter, Dylan, in their care. She was a good mother. I thought, oh, she's going to be asking me to babysit all the time. And I was just out of all that stuff. And I only had one child, and I didn't want to get back into that. And she didn't. Maybe once a month, you know, she'd ask me to babysit. And always after Dylan was already sleeping at night. But when Nicole fails to return home that night, her parents know something is very wrong. Recently, Nicole has been hanging out with a bad crowd, with a taste for booze and drugs. I knew that if she didn't come home and didn't let us know something was wrong, that she couldn't. The next morning, Nicole's father, Jerry, now deceased, heads straight to the Sayreville police to file a missing persons report. Detective Jim Novak is put in charge of the case. Parents know if something's really wrong with their child. I so said, what do you think, Mr. Rokas? came out and said that I think she's dead. Before you suspect foul play, you try and rule out all of the other common things that normally you find in a missing person's case, so especially an adult. There's really no crime to be a missing person. A description of Nicole and her vehicle, a black 1980 Chevy Malibu, are fed into the National Crime Information Computer System to see if any other police department in the United States ever had contact with that license plate. And there was no one that ran her license plate or her car wasn't found somewhere and run by the police. Jerry Arocas gives Detective Novak details about his daughter. She didn't like to drive her own car, especially at night. And he wasn't too fond of her choice of friends. He didn't particularly care for her boyfriend, Michael Reed. Detective Novak knows Mike Reed. Reed is a suspect in a recent string of car burglaries. I always thought he was the best liar I've ever met. He would, he would lie to me and smile as he did it. It was, it was almost like Charles Manson type thing. But her father's biggest fear is that his daughter's recent drug habit, heroin, might have something to do with her disappearance. Detectives start by interviewing some of Nicole's friends, Eric Nordling, Todd Connors, and Mike Reed. Detectives went into the house to check the house for Nicole. Other detectives interviewed the three occupants, uh, Eric, Todd, and Michael. And everyone denied having any further contact other than seeing Nicole leave that night to go what they called out to several bars to do some drinking. As we were leaving, Michael called to me. He said, uh, Mr. Novak, I want you to know, I didn't love Nicole. We were only friends. I looked at Detective Sergeant Sprague, and simultaneously, we said to each other, she's dead. And the reason we felt that way is because he used the past tense, and there was no reason at this point to think of Nicole as anything else than in the present, unless there was. But what? There's no evidence to back up a feeling. They continue to pursue the missing persons case, contacting local hospitals, checking towing reports, and connecting with state police. 
Two days go by, and there is no sign of Nicole or her car. At this point in the investigation, we had no leads. Once you don't come home for a number of days and no one hears from you for a number of days, now this person is really maybe not a, uh, just a missing person on their own account, but maybe in fact some kind of foul play may have occurred here. I would go out on the back porch every night and just look around and say, just send me a sign, something. Where are you? I know you're out here somewhere. Desperate for any answers, the family is willing to try anything. My uncle, Walt Werner, worked for the Hackensack Police Department, and he suggested a psychic that the police force sometimes used. Frank St. James lives in New Jersey and has a reputation for finding missing persons. I'm like a human satellite or something, going anywhere. Little blips of things I could draw in, get real close. Sometimes they come really quick in flashes. It's like looking through their eyes. But his one rule, no immediate family members in the session. Diane Macaluso, Pat Arokas' best friend, goes in her place. My husband and I uh, took a, a tape recorder with us to record the session, and we took a picture of Nicole with us. And what the picture shows him, no one really wants to hear. I tell you, I don't have a good feeling about it. It did expire sometime Sunday morning. Single mother Nicola Rokas of Sayreville, New Jersey, has been missing for three days. Psychic Frank St. James says she's dead. She did expire sometime Sunday morning. Oh, my heart sank when I heard that because I was still hoping that maybe she just went off with friends. The psychic claims to be picking up images of Nicole from the night she went out with friends. I pick up some drugs Saturday. The turnpike is off of there on one of those little side roads. She's not moved. She's not too far from home. Um, I do feel something by Thursday. Is the psychic right? Will they find Nicole by Thursday? I didn't have hope that she was alive. I knew that when she didn't contact us and didn't come home, I knew it. But I just had to find her. The Arocas invite the psychic to their home. Maybe here he can get a clearer picture of where their daughter might be. Left alone, he moves through the house. It's in the kitchen where Frank claims to connect with Nicole's spirit. Nicole started to come through really easy. It looked like I was flying up above near water, a dirt road, bridges, cattails her car in the marsh. One of the wheels was in the water, a feeling of closed in. I felt that if I was standing 25 feet away from where she was, I wouldn't be able to see her. I couldn't see it from the road. The only way is from above. Nicole's father takes the tape of both psychic sessions to Detective Novak. The investigator is skeptical, but he's also reached a dead end. I am not so naive to think that uh, just because I don't have a sp this special ability doesn't mean it wasn't given to someone else. No leads came, nothing. And it's not like we, we sat on our hands. I thought it doesn't hurt. Began checking all the areas that uh, would resemble areas described by the psychic. There was an old railroad bridge, area where it was tall cattails, area where it was marshy uh, land, you know, ponds, lakes, became up negative. And then the detective remembers something else the psychic had said. 
Have they uh, tried a helicopter in any of those uh, particular areas? We're only three days into the investigation at this point, and I'm going to ask for a helicopter. So I felt I was going to meet with the resistance. But the next day, Novak gets his helicopter. It's Thursday, June the 6th. One of the pilots asked why we're using the state police helicopter. And I said, well, we're following the leads of a psychic with respect to a missing person. I'm saying to myself, oh, please, God, please let us find something. Because if we don't, I am never going to live this down. Five minutes later, above a secluded marshy area, very similar to what the psychic visualized, they do spot something. The pilot asked what type of uh, vehicle we were looking for. And I explained to him it was a black Chevy we were looking for. At that point, he said, I think I have seen something down in the weeds right along the uh, Raritan Bay, as the helicopter made several circles above it to find a landing spot where we could land the uh, helicopter you could see that there was, in fact, someone inside the vehicle. But what they see from the air is not so easy to see on the ground. Well, it was necessary to land on the, the beach area because of the uh, tall cattails and uh, the debris. It was a landfill, maybe a mile square, just covered with the uh, cattails. You couldn't see anything. We each went in different directions. And uh, as I approached this one curve, I, uh, I, was, I was surprised because suddenly I saw the car, maybe 25 feet from the curb. And the psychic indicated that uh, you could be 25 feet from the car and not see it. The psychic had also said that he had a bad feeling about Nicole, that she was dead. Look in and I see the remains of what appeared to be a female. I noticed the position of her body car doors were locked. I radioed in the registration, confirmed that it was, in fact, Nicole's car. Once we opened the door of the vehicle, she didn't appear to be seated behind the driver's seat, that she happened to be more in the center of the vehicle between the driver's and the passenger's side, that the vehicle was still in gear, and the uh, ignition wasn't all the way on. Inside, police find a letter in Nicole's purse, dated June 1st, the night she disappeared. That appeared to be a semi-suicide note. Yet, there was no evidence that a suicide had occurred here. I remember being um, happy that they found her. But it was like I wanted to pass out, and I couldn't. I was like halfway, but you know. My heart just ached for Pat and, and Jerry and Dylan. The autopsy finds the cause of death, acute morphine toxicity, a heroin overdose. The county prosecutor rules her death a suicide, but was it? It didn't make any sense to me that she would do that. It doesn't add up for the detectives either. First, there's Nicole's letter found in her purse. The ink on a date was a different color than the body of the letter, and I thought that uh, was strange. Her mother confirms that Nicole often recorded her feelings, however dark. Nothing that went through her mind wasn't written down somewhere. Because she was living a dangerous life, and in case something happened, she wanted to make sure that people knew things, especially Dylan. Then, the location of the car. And I kept in mind what Nicole's father had told me. She didn't like driving at night, and she would have to drive over discarded railroad ties and uh, roofing material that was discarded in the area. There was no way that the Nicole drove herself to this particular location, especially at night. Somebody had to have driven her car there. And some of the things that really stood out were what wasn't there. No drug paraphernalia, there was no needles, no syringes, other than a ligature on the floor. And then Detective Novak remembers what the psychic said on the tape. Nicole was not alone when she died. There's at least two or three of them. They were there. They know what happened. There was more to this than a suicide. <laughs> 22-year-old Nicole Orokas has been found dead inside her car, 
abandoned in a secluded New Jersey marsh. It's ruled a suicide, but a psychic says others were involved, and the lead detective thinks so too. Anyone reading that letter could easily draw the uh, logical conclusion that this was a suicide. However, they didn't have the information that I had. Her boyfriend, on the first day of the investigation, referred to Nicole in the past tense. The position of her body, the fact that the call was locked. Most families, once a loved one commits suicide, kind of realize, after looking back, that the signs of suicide were there. They were depressed, or they were having some type of problem. The parents were pretty insistent that they didn't believe that Nicole had taken her own life. And if she did, in fact, do that, then the crime scene would have been totally different. Usually, when you die from a heroin overdose, the death is pretty instantaneous to the injection. There isn't time to remove the syringe from the vehicle, clean up the papers, dust off the dashboard, and, and make the car kind of neat. If you're going to inject yourself, you probably would have the car in park. The vehicle had actually been left in gear. If she had been, say, trying to leave the scene and all of a sudden the overdose kicked in and killed her, then that vehicle would have run out of gas before the police found her. Yet once we put the vehicle in neutral and turned the key on and started right up. The suicide note was folded up in her pocketbook. You would probably leave it out in the vehicle. So everything that seemed to be a suicide, just didn't seem to be adding up. If she didn't commit suicide, how did she die? Novak suspects Todd Connors, Eric Nordling, and her boyfriend, Mike Reed. Couldn't imagine why people I suspected would do such a thing to, to a friend. For the detectives, there seems to be only one answer. Under New Jersey law, if you cause someone's death by giving them a narcotic, it's technically a homicide. I brought in the uh, people involved. Got nowhere. The case is officially closed, but for Novak, it's still open. Sometimes it's better to take a step back, let the people involved come to the belief that they got away with something, and they begin to talk and, and tell friends. Over the next three months, his strategy starts to pay off. Just as much as I was repulsed by what had happened to Nicole, the friends of uh, Eric, Todd, and Mike Reed were just as repulsed because we began getting information through informants uh, with respect to what is being said. Mike Reed shot up Nicole, and she OD'd, and he dumped her out in the landfill. That information wouldn't have been admissible in court because it's hearsay. To have any chance of charging Mike Reed, they need confessions from the people who were with Nicole when she died. They keep waiting. After the call was processed at police headquarters, it was parked outside for the longest period of time. And every time I left police headquarters, I would look over the, at the car and I would say, come on, Nicole, help me out here. I repeated that uh, probably a hundred times. For the next three months, the case eats away at the detective until one December night. I was serving warrants at a, an apartment complex, totally unrelated to this, and I find this necklace. Uh, it was a child's necklace, uh, the name Nicole. Although it's not Nicole's necklace, the detective sees it as a sign. And I thought, this is Nicole's response to me. Maybe it's time that I bring these people in and talk to them again. But Mike Reed is in jail on an unrelated charge so Novak brings in his friends, Eric Nordling and Todd Connors. Eric was the first one to go in because we felt he was the weakest link. Sergeant Burns made Eric aware that he was familiar with uh, Eric's family. His family would be disappointed with the, what they had done with Nicole. At that point, Eric uh, tears up. Eric began to tell. But Todd Connors admits to nothing. I just confronted him, I yelled at him, this is what you do to her, you leave her there and rot? And he just looked away. We knew he had him, but he said he, he, he didn't want to talk anymore. Novak needs statements from both Connors and Nordling in order to charge Mike Reed with Nicole's death. A few weeks later, he gets his chance. He brings Todd Connors in on a contempt of court warrant from a nearby town, but this time he ups the ante. 
Novak brings in an investigator from the county prosecutor's office. She threatens to charge Connors with obstruction if he doesn't talk. It's Connor's last chance, and it works. Todd finally corroborates what Eric Nordling has already admitted, and what the psychic saw six months earlier, that Nicole was not alone when she died. According to their statements, around 8 p.m. on June 1st, 1996, Nicole, Todd, Eric, and Mike Reed head out to buy drugs. A half hour later in Perth Amboy, Nicole cashes her welfare check. At 9 p.m. in Newark, Mike Reed buys heroin. At a rest stop off the Garden State Parkway, Eric and Todd shoot up. Mike Reed shoots up Nicole. Todd and Eric fall asleep. When they come to, they're at the landfill, and Nicole is unconscious. Unable to revive her, they panic. But Mike Reed shows them the letter the one the police initially took as a suicide note. He wipes down the car, removes all the evidence, and locks the doors. All three walk the two miles back to Todd Connor's house. She would have never done that to them. That's, that's what bothered me, never. Even if she had to be found guilty, she would have never done that. On December 16, 1996, Michael Reed is charged with the drug-induced death of Nicola Rokas. He pleads guilty and is sentenced to 10 years in prison. Todd Connors and Eric Nordling walk free. Obstruction charges against them are dropped in exchange for their statements. We had nothing. We found Nicole based on the information supplied to us by the psychic, Frank St. James. And that's it. It's just, I don't see how anyone could dispute it. I can't explain it, nor would I even attempt to. I would certainly not have a problem with talking to a psychic or talking to the devil himself if it would help us solve some of our unsolved crimes. I've done hundreds of cases. This was particularly gratifying, I guess, too, and sad at the same time, but I felt I, I helped the family at least. Nothing goes right forever. There's no closure, you never see them again. She didn't have a normal funeral, none of it was the same. Everything was messed up. 